Father, we just thank you today that you came before us and that you made a way for us, that you are the ultimate provider, that you are the ultimate healer. God, I just pray today that you would just open our hearts to you, any healing in our hearts that we might need from you, God, I just pray that you would heal our hearts. I pray that you would help us turn to you when we're scared, when we're frustrated, when we're happy, and when we're joyful as well. It is in your name that we pray today. Amen. Morning, everybody. My name is Aaron Long. I'm the lead pastor here at Simple Church. I want to say thanks for joining us this morning. I hope this time of worship so far has been you know, a powerful moment for you as you experience God's presence and, and uh, connect, took time to connect with Him. We're going to jump into what we're doing today. We are in a season of prayer. We call it our 21 days of prayer. Uh, this is actually today starts week number three, and uh, I want to tell you that this time of prayer is always a powerful time of year for us. We do it twice a year in January, but we also do it in August because after the hustle and bustle of the summer season, we gather back together to place our focus back on God because while a lot of us take vacation from our jobs, we also oftentimes take vacation from our priority relationships with each other and with God. And so this is our season to get back in and say, God, you're important to us. We're going to get back into our rhythm of spending time with God. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been joining together Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. for a live time of reading God's word and praying through it. And uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't joined us yet so far, start this week. Start on Monday. It's at 8 a.m. When the, it's all over with, we will post it so that you can watch it uh, any time during that day. But uh, we'll, we will be live where you can interact with us and ask questions right here in our online campus. Uh, and then we'll rebroadcast that for you on our social media so that you can catch it there. But, but during this time, this 21 days of prayer, we also do a series on prayer where we're we're talking about how do we pray? What does it mean to pray? And this year we've decided to tackle the subject of dangerous prayers. So for the past couple of weeks here is where we've been. We talked about the very first dangerous prayer was make me bold. God, make us bold. The second prayer was Lord, speak to me. And that was last week. We talked about how God can speak to you, wants to speak to you, and what happens when he does speak to you. This week I'm going to warn you that this is a prayer that you're not going to like. And I think either or even some of you that are tuned in today that will refuse to pray it. Because honestly, when you listen to uh, the way I'm going to talk about it here, you're going to be like, Aaron, if you're trying to sell me on that idea, that's kind of a tough sell. None of that sounds great. None of that sounds awesome. But I promise you that it is. I promise you that this kind of prayer, as difficult as it may be, leads to such life-giving opportunities uh, in, 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 for you. And so you're going to want to be part of it. But uh, this kind of prayer is not a common prayer that you're going to hear. It's not an easy prayer to pray because it doesn't feel good. Uh, it isn't safe. And it isn't consistent with the God should make my life easy version of Christianity that exists today. Uh, now, I, don't get me wrong. I like easy and safe prayers, man. I, I want to pray, and I do pray. God, bless me, Lord. Look, God, keep my family safe. Lord, give me traveling mercies. Lord, help me to preach today. Like, God, help me have a good day. Look, like, I, I'm praying prayers. Like, God, I don't want to be inconvenienced today, so let everything go my way. I don't want to be interrupted by any kind of challenges today. So, God, keep all the problems away and, and no, no troubles today. God, that'd be great. Give me a day with no issues free Chipotle and coffee, close parking spaces, new episodes of my favorite show, some sunshine and 70 degree weather, and my kids behaved, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Come on, guys. You know you pray those prayers. I pray those prayers too. We like things that are easy and safe, but this prayer, this prayer today is not a safe prayer. It is one of the most dangerous prayers that you can pray because it will make you uncomfortable. It will frustrate you at times. It will make your life harder, not easier, if you'll accept my invitation to pray this dangerous prayer. And you need to know that dangerous prayers exist because following Jesus was never meant to be safe. So dangerous prayer number three in our series is break my heart. Man, we are going to need some courage in order to pray a prayer where we ask God to break our hearts. Now, we're asking God to break it, to strip it down, to crush it of all comfort, of all ease, of all spiritual apathy that exists within us. And I'm going to warn you that if you decide to pray this dangerous prayer, that God will answer it. And you'll be burdened. You'll have a burden for people. You'll have a burden for, for uh, the, the things that are on God's heart. Your heart will grieve and you'll have a heartache over the injustices that exist in this world. If you pray this prayer, you might lose sleep at night. You might have difficulty resting well because the injustices that exist in the world and the issues that you see, you might burn with a righteous anger in your heart. You might wind up doing things that others simply don't understand in response to the way God breaks your heart. As a result of the way he breaks your heart, you might face resistance. People might not be on your side anymore. You might face some opposition and some criticism. People might think that what you're doing and who you want to reach and what God has called you to do might be crazy. You might suffer some persecution as a result. And in all your pain and in all your agony and all of your discomfort, you're going to find joy because you will be blessed as your heart breaks over something that breaks the heart of God. You will be blessed as your heart breaks over something that breaks the heart of God. Man, if you're taking notes at home today, that's, that's the one right there. Somebody should be screenshotting this, sharing it on their social medias, texting it to somebody right now, and keeping it in mind because it will be the motivation behind the people that will pray this prayer today. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to start with the prophet Jeremiah today because Jeremiah is a prophet that existed in the Old Testament he spoke to the people of Jerusalem. He was one of the last prophets that existed. He, he spoke to them just before Babylon came in and crushed them and exiled them off to Babylon. And Jeremiah was around for the last kings that existed in Israel. And Jeremiah got a nickname. And it wasn't the powerful prophet. It wasn't the preaching prophet. It wasn't the spitting hellfire and brimstone prophet, although those are awesome names. no. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet, which I think is an unfortunate nickname. I would, I would list a whole, a whole slew of other names that I would rather have than that one. Even my nickname back in high school, Smalls, does not compare to that one, the weeping prophet. Like, you know people made fun of him. You know people picked on him and bullied him with a name like that and a reputation like that. But they called him that because Jeremiah's heart broke for people as God's heart broke for those people. Let me give you a little bit of context. Here's what's going on. Jeremiah is speaking into an environment where the people of Judah are rebelling against God. There are rampant injustices all around. The leadership and the community were abusing the widows and the poor of their community. They were sacrificing their children to false god Moloch. Uh, they had broken God's heart at every turn, and the kings were wicked. And Jeremiah shared in the brokenness that God had for his people. And in Jeremiah 8, verse 18, he says, My grief is beyond healing. My heart is broken. I hurt with the hurt of my people. This is what happens when God breaks your heart. I mourn and I'm overcome with grief. Jeremiah's heart was broken for these people. And Jeremiah did what he knew to do. He preached fiery, passionate sermons, which you can read all throughout the book of Jeremiah as he rebukes the people, as he calls them to repentance, as he calls them to God's grace. He prays, he fasted, he even threatened them at times, and yet things remain unchanged. Jeremiah said, my grief is unbearable. My heart is 
broken. Do any of you want that? Do you understand what it means to want that? Because most of us, even me included, want the opposite of that. What we want is comfort. Man, I, I want comfort. I want comfort from the beginning of, from the time that I wake up in the morning. I want to come down to breakfast and I want to have a choice of sausage or bacon. I want to sit in a comfy chair. I want a million likes on all of my posts. I want to drink coffee all day and still sleep soundly at night. I want comfort. But this dangerous prayer of break my heart. It's clear, and I'm going to be clear with you, that this prayer isn't about asking God to give you a spiritual blessing or to give you a spiritual interest or to give you a spiritual hobby, something like, like we're not talking about good deeds, like, you know, like, you know what I really hate, Aaron? I really hate driving down the road and seeing someone standing on the side of the road holding a sign saying, we'll do anything for food, God bless, and so I always give them a little bit of money. Listen, that's not, that's not a passion. That's not something your heart is broken about. That's something that you deal with. You, when you see it, you, deal, you give them a few dollars, or maybe you buy them a meal. Congratulations, that's awesome. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about when you find a stray puppy and you can't find where that puppy belongs. So you adopt that puppy and you bring that dog in and you love that dog. And your, your friends and your families are like, can I pet that dog? Can I pet that dog? Can I pet that dog? Like, I'm good for your dog. I'm glad your dog is surrounded by people that love it. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about simple, small things. I'm talking about a gut-wrenching burden that only God gives you, something that consumes your thoughts, consumes your mind. It doesn't let up. It is relentless in the way that it eats at you and gnaws at your heart to the point that you begin seeing it in everywhere in society, and you have no choice but to act. Now, it's no wonder this, is, this doesn't sound appealing to you because this is opposite of everything that our cultures programmed us to want. It is the opposite of the soft, feel-good version of American Christianity. Christianity today is really all about my best life now. It's my year of harvest. It's my year of abundance. It's the year of the Lord's favor. Bless the Lord God forever. It's time to multiply. It's time to increase. It's time to live abundantly. It's time for acceleration. It's time to give la or live lavishly so we can give lavishly. It's time to name it and claim it. It's time to blab it and grab it. It's time to talk like you are blessed so that you can walk like you are blessed. We want to sing the songs. We are blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We are blessed. And we want Christianity to be all about being blessed. We want it to be all about these things. And don't get me wrong. God desires to bless you. And there are blessings that are for you when you walk with Jesus. We like that stuff. It gets us amped up because it's all about us. But let me ask you something. What if God's greatest blessings, what you and I desire, come from God's greatest breakings. What if the best that he has to offer for you in your life come on the other side of your heart being broken for a group of people in your community? What if God breaks your heart for what breaks his? If he blesses you with a holy hurt and he blesses you with a burden for a people? What if that's the best gift? What if that's the best blessing? Now, again, like I said, that doesn't sound comfortable, does it? We want comfort. I want comfort. I, I, I love, I love indulging in comfort. I'm sitting in a comfy chair right now. I'm wearing comfy clothes. I, I like, there's a whole bunch of you crazy people. You like doing something called camping. You know what I like to do? Glamping. <laughs> It is glamorous camping. It's that when I go out into the wilderness, I find me a, a, a cabin with air conditioning. And I roll up in there with my grills. I roll up in there with my mattresses, with my blankets, with my fluffy pillows, with all the comforts of home. And I roll in there and I live like a king in the middle of nowhere. Basically, I take my house from here and all the comforts of home and I just put it in that house where I'm going to live for a week. That's glamping. That's my kind of style. I don't want to sit out in the middle of a wilderness and sleep on the ground in a tent in the humidity and the heat or the rain or whatever weather God wants to have, have shower on that spot and, and for that time. No thank you. No thank you. I want comfy. 
I want a comfy chair to sit in while I do my work and while I prep my sermons and while I read. That's why I've got one of those, those purple brand uh, comfort seats pads, right? So I can sit on there and it's nice and squishy and I can sit all day long without being fatigued. I want that. I want things soft on my feet. That's why I wear the Sanook brand flip-flops that are like the yoga mat style so it feels like I'm walking on a yoga mat all day long. I like comfort. I like technology that brings comfort, don't you? Come on, somebody, share with me in the, in the comments. Don't leave me hanging all alone. You like comfort, too. I went this one time, uh, uh, my boss took me to a hotel uh, for a convention that we, we were going to, and we stayed at this really fancy hotel. And I went in, and the entire room was created for your comfort, from the rain kind of like showers that they had to to being able to lay in the bed, the big, soft, cushy bed with my 20 pillows, I was able to control every piece of technology in that room, which included opening and closing the curtains and the windows, turning on and off the lights, the television, the thermostat, and all from this little, this little like iPad-looking thing that I held in my hands. Man, I like comfort. I love it. But comfort never once moved me to action. It never moved me to action. In fact, comfort begets more comfort. We want the more luxurious life. We'd like that. We desire it, crave it. But luxury will never shake us to care more about those who are suffering. It'll just never happen. Comfort and luxury lend themselves to pain-free lifestyles. But the pain-free lifestyles never make us more like Christ. Pain is a refiner's fire. It allows us, allows God into spaces and places within us so that he can do work on us. Suffering strengthens us. Trials make us look more like Jesus. In James 1, 1, he says, count it all joy when trials and tribu tribulations come your way because God's at work in you. He's building you up. He's working on your character. You need to know that God's more about your character than he is your comfort. He wants to work on you and he wants to do something in you. And pain and a breaking of your heart, praying this dangerous prayer, God, break my heart, is a way to achieve that. It snaps us out of a self-centered pursuit of ease where we have to do something, where we, we wind up in a, in a place, in a space where we can't not do something. We're compelled. And when you look throughout Scripture, you'll find that there are a whole lot of people that were compelled by their passions that were compelled by what broke their hearts. You'll find it first in, in, the, in the story of Moses. Moses was a young Hebrew boy. He was, he was prophesied about that a deliverer was coming, and as a young boy, he was spared from, uh, from, from a full genocide of children, and he winds up in the, pal in the uh, Pharaoh's house as a Hebrew boy in the Egyptian palace being raised by the, Egypt, uh, by the Pharaoh's daughter. And he grows up being nursed and in contact with his own family, knowing that he is a deliverer of his people, the Hebrews, who are enslaved. And he watches as Egypt beats his people every day, unfairly. And at one point in time, his heart breaks. He sees what's going on. His eyes are open to the mistreatment and, his, and the, the oppression that was upon his people. And he is moved to act on their behalf. And he kills one of the Egyptians uh, that was beating one of his people. Now, years go by because he, he realizes he's become a murderer, but he, God calls him back. And he winds up standing before Pharaoh and standing in the courts of Egypt with a powerful statement and a declaration that he was sent on God's behalf to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. You look into uh, the, the, another story. There's a story of David. David is a young shepherd boy. He is a boy who lives in a time when his nation is at war and Saul was king over Israel. And his dad called David in from the fields and said, David, here's some bread and some cheese. Go take it to your brothers who are on the front lines. And so David goes out and visits his brothers and he finds that the battle is at a standstill because the Philistines have brought a champion. They have brought a giant and his name was Goliath. You know this story, many of you, even if you've never read your Bible, you know the story of David and Goliath. And David steps out and he finds out who is this guy? And Goliath steps onto the field, and this is where he makes his big mistake. He starts trash-talking God and saying that, that, that he is going to destroy the Israelites. Well, David, who is zealous 
for the presence of God. He says, who is this guy? He's absolutely nobody. His heart breaks, and he winds up standing in front of Goliath with nothing but a sling and a stone, and he says, who are you to come against my God? And he winds up killing and beheading that giant. What about the story of Nehemiah? Nehemiah, he was living in, in the palace. He was one of those ones that was exiled uh, to Babylon, and here he is. He's living in the palace. He's got a comfy life, even though he's got a high-risk job. He's the cupbearer, which means that every time a cup is brought to the king, he's got to drink from it and see if there's any poison in it. Yuck. What, that's not a great job, but a great location, right? It's all about location, location, location. So anyway, he's in the palace, and he's being a cupbearer for the king. And he gets some tragic news from the home front that, that Israel is in shambles and that the walls of his city that he loves is torn down. That his people are exposed to attacks on every side. And so his heart breaks and he cries out to God and he prays. And at the risk of his own life, he goes before the king whom he serves and he tells him what's going on. And he says, I need to go home. His heart was broken. He wasn't a builder. He didn't know, un, know and understand construction. That, that wasn't the point. His heart was broken and he knew he had to do something about it. So he went home and he did. Jesus was the same way. Guys, you need to know that Jesus, though he was fully God and fully man, he had the heart of the Father. They are, the two have the same heart. Jesus even said at one point in time, I don't say anything unless I've heard it from the Father. That means he had his heart. And we see that Jesus in uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, he says, when he saw the crowds, because see, that's what will happen when your heart is broken. Your eyes will be open. You'll be shook from your comfort, from your spiritual apathy, so that you can start seeing the pain that's in people's eyes and their lives. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. He saw them for who they really were, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had to do something in response to what he saw. In fact, this is not the only place that we see Jesus saw something and was moved to act on, in compassion. It says that about a leper in Mark 1, Jesus was moved with compassion to not only heal the leper, but to touch him. You weren't supposed to do that. He touched the leper. In Matthew 20, verse 34, there are blind guys that he healed. He was moved with compassion. In Luke 7, 13, he was moved with compassion by what he saw, and he raised a man from the dead. He was moved by what he saw and how his heart was broken for people. And it cost him. It interrupted his schedule. It drove his behaviors. It dictated his relationships. It told him where to go and when. If you pray this, and I dare you to, God, break my heart. It's going to shake you out of your continual pursuit of comfort and stir you with a divine burden that you simply cannot ignore. It will give you eyes to see those who are hurting so that you have to be moved by compassion to do something. And I know you might be thinking like, okay, Aaron, I understand this. This is a great opportunity for me to do something. I'll start my own 501c3, and that's how I'll respond to this. I'll get a web page going. I'll become an influencer. That's, that's awesome, and that may be the right way for you to start. But let me just throw out a warning there that no matter how you start this journey, that, that God may call you to start something, and you may wind up starting it in a funeral home. We did. God called me to this city, began breaking my heart for the people of this city, Reynoldsburg, that we live in. And we couldn't find a place to be, and we started our church in a funeral home. And when you get it started, your first weekend open, you may have 117 people. I'll never forget, that was the exact number of people we had on our first day. And then the second Sunday, you're going to have 57 people, because that's exactly what we had. And then within a few weeks, you're going to have 35, and you're going to go, dear God, you called me to do this. I'm being moved with compassion. What is happening? Like, wh however God breaks your heart and for whom, it may be years before anything happens in that area as you try to make progress. There may be roadblocks along the way trying to prevent you and keep you from doing what God has called you to do wherever and with whom he's called you to do it. There may be dead ends. Like, you may think you have it right. You may think you found God's blessing and the thing that's going to lead you into a moment of favor and that door closes in your face so fast that it almost smashes your face. You may have doubts along the way because it should be easier than this, right? 
and sometimes it's just not. You might find, have, have great expectations, but find crushing disappointments. You might have heart-wrenching setbacks and tears and tears and more tears along the way. You might be able to help a few people, but see them maybe drift back into addiction or back into the lifestyle that you were there to help them get out of. There's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. There's going to be highs and there's going to be lows. There's going to be rejoicing. There's going to be crying. There's going to be celebrating and sadness. And that might all happen in one day. It's intense when God breaks your heart. When you pray that prayer, God, break my heart. Get ready to ache. Maybe you, you'll, you'll, you'll ache for the unborn children of this world who are being mercilessly discarded from their mother's wombs. Maybe your heart will ache for children who don't know how to read. Maybe, maybe, maybe your heart will, will ache for those that are caught in human trafficking. You want to help them get out. Or maybe it's for the racial injustices of the world or for those that don't have clean water or those that are in financial bondage or those, that are, that, that those children without a loving home or those that are suffering from mental illness or those that are trapped by their addictions or marriages that want to heal, heal from the infidelities that have occurred and they don't know if they're ever going to be able to love again or to be close to one another again. Or maybe, maybe you have a heart for teens who are cutting themselves so that they can experience some kind of pain and some kind of life. Or, or maybe your heart is for those who are depressed or those who are addicted to pornography or those that are struggling with drugs or those that, maybe it's just for students. And so, man, you give your life to our Ignite student ministry. Week after week you show up because you know there are teens who need the life that Jesus offers. Or maybe you're like my friend Shana. Man, she found out that, that girls uh, in, in, uh, in Africa, they are, are not allowed to get an education for one week of the month. And a lot of girls, because they are, they are out because of their menstrual cycles, I'll go ahead and say it, they're out once a week or once a month for their menstrual cycles. They, they wind up, a lot of them, getting so far behind in their education that they wind up dropping out of school. And that broke her heart. So she started a company called Kana that, was, that created period-proof panties, okay? Some of you are like, Aaron, I can't believe you're talking about this. I'm talking about it. It's real life. Kana is a real company, and you can support them. When you purchase a pair, you purchase there's an additional pair that is sent over to Africa for these girls who need it so that they can stay in school because they don't have access to feminine products. And so this provides it for them. Not only did that, but she's looking to source the creation of these very products in their hometown, providing jobs and education for these young women. God may break your heart and it may lead you to do something powerful, to step out of anything you've ever known, to step into the unknown. When you pray this dangerous prayer, he breaks your heart. And when he does, you better thank God for that broken heart. You better thank him because most people think, well, it would be easier if I didn't care. It, I would rather not know the wrongs and the injustices that are going on in this world today. It would be better not to be involved. But I say it is not better because it's better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. It is better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. So when God breaks your heart, thank him for breaking your heart. When he opens your eyes so that you can see what's going on in your move to compassion, thank him for it because there's no greater joy than knowing that your life will be poured out to make a difference in the life of someone else's. Paul understood this himself. Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, I say that every time I mention his name, but I really want you to know your Bible and I want you to know who he is. But Paul was was a Jew, and he was part of the Pharisaical sect of the Jew of the religious leaders. Okay, so he was a Jew and a Pharisee, but he would be what we would call a false believer. Like he didn't believe in the Christ at that time. He believed in following all the rules, all six hundred and some of them. He believed that that he had no relationship with God, but he believed that his rules were what was going to save him. That if he followed the law, he would be he would be perfect. He would be righteous, and so. We see that he said he also brags about himself. In Philippians 3, he said he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the Hebrew of all Hebrews. He followed all 613 laws to a T. He was faultless. But when he met Jesus, he said that all of that stuff, all of the time spent in it, all of the stuff he had memorized, everything that he had done and lived in his life was all too lost. That everything he gained was found in Christ. 
That's why Paul said in Romans 9, he said this, with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter, bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people. His heart was broken for his people. My Jewish brothers and sisters, so much so was Paul's heart broken for these people. The burden so heavy in his life, the passion so great for them. Watch what he says. I would be willing, he would be willing to be forever cursed. That means cut off from Christ. That we're talking about eternity in hell. We're talking about separation from our heavenly father. To be cut off from Christ, that's what that means. He's like, I'm willing to suffer hell if that would save them heart was burdened this is a dangerous prayer that we pray it's dangerous when you pray this prayer you begin to hurt for people you begin to hurt for very specific reasons for very specific people groups today my heart hurts for Christians, which maybe this is some of you, who feel like Christianity is really just about being morally good, being a good person, going to church on Sunday, checking it off the list, throwing some money in an offering plate. Maybe you even serve a little bit here and there. And, but you have no relationship with God. You, you're not right with Him. You, you've completely misunderstood. It's not just about being a good person and living a good moral life following what we call the rule book. It's, it's not what it's about. My heart breaks for you. My heart grieves for those that are far from God who are looking for life and lifeless things, who are looking for life at the end of a bottle, who are looking for life in a needle, who are looking for life in sex and relationships and money and career and social media likes. They're looking for life and all of these things and they're never going to find it. They're, they're never going to find it. My heart grieves and i hate it when so-called christians fall for religion they get caught up in the religiosity of it and everything that they can do and and when that happens what they do not only do they miss out on the grace but they also begin to refuse to give that grace to others and they push people away from christ i get angry when people believe the lives of the evil one and, and become enslaved by sin I hate it when people ignore their gifts that God has placed inside of them, the callings that he has given them, because they're missing out on the very purpose, the very thing that God wants to do for them. I, my heart breaks for people in this season whose priority is their politics and not the people that God has called them to reach. My heart breaks, and I have been grieved, and I've cried so many tears over the last few weeks, watching the church of Jesus Christ rip itself apart over politics. And I'm thankful for that pain. I'm thankful for that pain that leads me to a place where I pray. Because every day I'm driven to do something eternal, something that matters in someone's life. It's part of my journaling. I, I write it in my journal every day. This is the way I made a difference in somebody's life today. It is a goal of mine. My heart is broken by something that breaks the heart of God. And if you'll be willing to pray this dangerous prayer, God, break my heart. He'll break it. And I promise you that on the other side of the discomfort of the breaking of your heart, you'll find that, was, that which is better for you. Because it's better to have this heart that is broken for what God's heart is broken for than to live a life without purpose. Amen, everybody. Let's pray. Father, today I pray that you would just break our hearts. I pray today for those who are willing to pray this prayer, who are bold enough to pray this prayer, who are stepping into the space of discomfort saying, God, wreck us take us into spaces and places of discomfort. I pray today that you would shake us from our spiritual apathy, and I pray for those who are praying this prayer right now, let them experience your greatest blessing that comes on the other side 
of the breaking. Now let's, let me look here at the camera right now for those of you that find yourself in a place where you feel far from God. We exist as a church. All of this, every bit of the, of the time that my staff pours into production, every bit of the time that our social media team poured into the advertisements and every bit of time that somebody spent inviting you to this place in this space to a watch party or to watch online on your own or, or however you are engaging with this content right now. All of this work, all of this effort has been covered in prayer and has been set and done for this moment. We do it all for you. You need to know that I pray for you, that I expected you to be here today. I expected you to be here, and I long for you to know the freedom that comes from knowing God. I want you to know the peace that's available to you. I want you to know the joy that's available to you. I want you to experience the power that God has available to you, that when you are in relationship with him, through a relationship with Jesus, that when you, you accept his lordship in your life, God fills you with his spirit, and it's the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's power, man. He wants to fill you with that power. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to give you eternity in heaven with him. And he wants to make you brand new and give you a full and fulfilled life here on this earth. And I have been praying for you. There are people likely sitting next to you, people that invited you to this place in this space that have been praying for you. And if you're ready, now can be your moment. If you're ready right now on your screen, if you're in our online campus, it says, I'm raising my hand to say yes to Jesus in the chat box. Click that button and pray this prayer with me. No matter where you're at, I don't care if you're listening to this five years after this aired, God is ready to meet you. God is not bound by time. God planned this moment for you. So pray this prayer with me. Say it now. Say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sins. And show me how to live for you. Make me brand new today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today, all of heaven, the Bible says, is celebrating and rejoicing over you. And we want you to know we are so proud of you. If you click that button and raised your hand, there's a, another screen open that said, fill out a connection card. Please do that. Let us have an opportunity to celebrate with you. We want to get you a Bible. We want to get you connected to a church. We want to help you on your next steps because, man, this is just a journey that is just beginning for you, and we want to be your church and to help you do it. And if we're not able to be your church, you're like, man, I'm really feeling God, but I'm not necessarily feeling this vibe. I'm needing something else. We'll help you find a church. Fill out that connection card. Let us begin the conversation, and we would love to walk with you and, uh, and get you connected to a community of believers. You need it. You're not supposed to do it alone. Amen, everybody? All right. And uh, if you aren't in our online campus, there is links that are being shared uh, for Connect Cards where you can click that and uh, let us know, man, I made a commitment today. Maybe you want more information about our church. Uh, go ahead and fill those out and we will get you connected. At this time, I want to give an opportunity for those of you that the Lord is speaking to you about uh, giving. And uh, he may be speaking to you about giving of, uh, of an offering that is above and beyond your tithes and, and even reminding you to be faithful in giving your tithes. And uh, we thank you for that. Uh, this is an opportunity to do that. Ways to do that are popping up on the screen right now. You can do that online. You can mail in checks. You can do that on your phone through our text to give. Text any dollar amount to the number 84321. Choose Simple Church if it's your very first time, and every dollar that you give will come right here and help us uh, continue to reach people that are far from God and teach them to follow Jesus step by step. So feel free to do that. Uh, as I share the last couple things, as we close out our service today, again, we're in 21 days of prayer. This is the last week of it. You can join us Monday through Friday online at 8 a.m. Saturday. It's just a devotional that gets posted on our social media. Uh, but uh, you can join us right here in this online campus at 8 a.m. sharp. We jump right in to God's word. It lasts about 15, 20 minutes. And so that means that you can turn it on while you're driving to work. You can turn it on after work because we'll repost it for you so that you can listen to it for the day. But it has a very specific prayer focus for you for the day. You don't want to miss it. It'll be a blessing to your life. It'll be a blessing to your spiritual life. Even if you missed all the other ones, jump in. Also, we want to remind you about the our In This Together campaign. If you go to our website, there is a section that says In This Together, and it is our response right now to this pandemic and the ways that we are responding right now. We have uh, it, lots of ways to help you if you need help. 
uh, with groceries, if you need somebody to talk to, a counselor or a coach, uh, even, even talking to a pastor, that is your on-ramp to do that. If you need food for your children, we have a daily feeding program we do right here in the city, Monday through Friday at 5.30. You can stop by, even if you don't live in the community where we're serving, you can stop by and grab meals for your kids. We'll give each of your kids two meals. Uh, and uh, they are all prepackaged, and it's all safe uh, and, and ready for you to go so you don't have to worry about, about making contact with uh, anybody that's prepared food. It's all prepackaged uh, food that comes from the stores, and it's all in a nice little pack for you. So, 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 so come by and, and get a meal uh, for your kids if you need that, but you can find out the information on that on our In This Together section on our website. And then, of course, grow groups are coming very soon. So uh, we launched those the uh, first week in September, uh, first full week in September, rather. And uh, we need leaders for those groups and would love for you to lead a group. There is a link that is being shared right now for you to be able to do that. You can also log on to our website and that will help you do that. But uh, we'd love for you to lead a group and there is a way for you to do that. So please take a step. Maybe this is something that God will break your heart for is people that need a group specifically in this season where we're not meeting together in person as a church. They need you to open your home so that they can grow closer to Jesus. Amen, everybody. So let's do that in this season. All right, listen, guys, I love you so much. Thanks for tuning in to week three of Dangerous Prayers. Join us next week for week four and the final message in this series. God bless you. We'll see you back here next week.